better place. Oh, come on, church, lift up your worship. There's no better place. We know, we know that in your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run. Let's sing that again in your presence. In your presence there is peace. In your presence we are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place in your presence. In your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run to you. In your presence there is peace. In your presence we are free. There's no better place. No better place. No better place to be. In your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run. Oh, we forever. Run to you, for in your presence there is peace. In your presence we are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. And in your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We fall. Before touch from you, hallelujah. We are desperate to touch you with our worship and to touch you with our praise. God, we are desperate to talk to you. We are desperate, God, to hear from you. We are people, Lord, that is desperate for a mighty God to move and to have his way 
in this place tonight. Amen, church. Amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat if you can. Praise the Lord, church. Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. Amen. I hope you are too. Uh, this morning, we had uh, the largest crowd at our Bible study we've had since February. And if you were here this morning, you saw that. Uh, people want to be in church. And I love that. People need church. Amen. Hallelujah. They need Jesus. They need a fellowship. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, is where we get the name of this church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. You know, it's his church. And he's got a plan for his church. And he wants his people to be together. It's so important, the fellowship, the brothers and sisters in Christ that we have. And so I cherish the gatherings that we have. I really, really, really do. And uh, it's something that's necessary and needed. I want to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up, speaking of gatherings. Uh, this Friday, I would like to have, it's not this, this Friday we're having a work night on our men's bathroom. And praise the Lord, Lord willing, we're going we're gonna to get done with it. And it's been a long project. The women's restroom is beautiful. Men's bath restroom is going to be handsome. And it will be ready after this Friday. Uh, but I need your help. I need you to show up. We're going to hook some things up. You guys go in there and take a look at it. If you're not sure what tools you're going to need, bring some tools. Uh, we got some tools here, but bring some tools. We'll get it done. We'll work. We'll start about 5. If you can get here at 5, get here at 5. Get here a little after, get a little after. We'll get here as soon as you can. We'll stay till about 8.30. We'll clean up. We'll go to dinner somewhere, okay, on me. Uh, but that's going to be this Friday, and that's going to set the stage for a few weeks from now. It's family weekend, and we do this every single year, and it's our biggest weekend every single year. It is so much fun. Uh, it used to be just a single day. Now it's the whole weekend. So uh, Saturday night, we're going to be meeting at the O'Banion's house for our church family picnic at 5 o'clock. Don't worry if you don't know where it's at. I'm going to send you directions. Just make sure I got your phone number. Okay, because I need your phone number to send you those directions. Um, if, you, if, if you know I don't have your phone number, grab one of the cards at the Giving Center. Right there in that back corner, there's a box on the wall. It's a Giving Center where people place their, their tithe and their offerings. Um, but beside it is a table, and not only are there envelopes there, but there are cards where you can put your name and your phone number on it, so that way I can put that in the system and send you texts throughout the week. Uh, so anyway, do that. If I don't already have that, I want that. Um, and... After that, by the way, we'll have inflatables that night for the kids. We'll have cornhole. We'll have some, some volleyball maybe, some different games for, for kids and adults alike, and just a lot of great food. We're going to provide the meat. Uh, we're going to provide the drinks. We're going to provide the paper products and napkins and plates and spoons and forks and all that stuff. You bring a side. And bring a big side if you can. If you can bring a big side to feed 20, that would be fantastic. Because last year I think we had about 120 people there. Uh, I don't know how many will be there this year, but it will be a lot. And so we'll, we'll take care of this stuff. You just bring a side, okay? Um, the next day, we won't have Sunday morning Bible study. The brunch, we're not going to have it the next day. We're going to take the morning off. If you want to go to church with your other relatives and family and friends, go do that. And then Sunday night, bring them all back here. And so you'll see cards on the way and on the way out. Those are family night cards. That's for that specific service. It's a family-oriented service. Kids will be joining us. We'll have a lot of illustrations on the PowerPoint. And it'll be a lot of fun, family-oriented. Bring all your family, all your friends, all your neighbors. Uh, it's going to be a blowout. Most importantly, bring the ones that don't have church. You know, that's, this is kind of a, an opportunity, an excuse to get those unchurched loved ones, unchurched friends. To hey, man, it's a you ain't got to come any other time of year. Just come to this one. And they're going to meet Jesus here that night. Amen. Pray they're going to get saved. So anyway, those things are coming up. And, and one other thing I'll, 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 I'll stress, we haven't used these in a couple of weeks, but just reminding you, we've got these bracelets in the back. A black one uh, represents uh, you hug and high five and whatever else. Uh, Jessica's clapping because she's a toucher. And if you're not careful, <laughs> she'll touch you. So if you don't want her to touch you, grab a blue one. And make sure you hold it up when she comes close. All right, or me, because I'm, you know, same way. So uh, blue just means that uh, you're keeping your distance. Talk to me, don't touch me. And white means don't even look at me. No, no, no. You got to usually, you know, it's people that just, they just, they just want to stay. Uh, if you want to stay separated from people, 
We've spaced the seats out. We encourage you to do whatever, however you feel welcome, however you feel safe. We want people to attend at their comfort level. Uh, by all means, if you're wearing a mask, wear a mask. If you, if you want to wear a mask, we provide even more. I encourage those who want to wear a mask to do so. Uh, we need to protect ourselves and stay safe. But I will say this, uh, and listen up. Church is about the safest place you can be in a pandemic. It really is. It really, really is. Uh, I, I looked this week. Some of you guys haven't heard it. I'm going to say it again. Um, I might even post it on Facebook this week. I don't know. I just want to encourage people. Uh, I want people to know uh, the statistics and context, okay? Um, if you're not living in a nursing home, uh, there's a, there's, it, all the statistics are right there on CDC and on Kentucky.gov, and that's all I did. I just went to the government websites and the CDC websites. Um, and as a matter of fact, you are twice as likely this year to die from a car wreck than you are from COVID. Uh, if you're the type of person that gets in cars and drives places, you're, you should be the type of person that goes to church because you're twice as likely to live by going to church. Okay? It's a very safe thing to do, and, and, and we do. We, we clean. We do everything we can to protect people. People get viruses just like every other cold and flu and virus that's out there, so you might contract a virus, but you're, very not, you're not likely to die from it. Um, if you're not living in a nursing home. So I just want to encourage you, it's a safe place to be. If you want to keep your distance, by all means do so. I encourage you to do that. Um, but do understand you are safe here. You're, you're, you're twice as likely to die from a gunshot. And there are people carrying guns in here. So <laughs> twice they, as likely. They aren't going to shoot you. They're not going to shoot you, though. Unless you've got a black bracelet on. And try to, or a white bracelet and, and try to touch them. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. Pastor Terry, would you please come now and receive? Yeah, I think it's time for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is so good to be in church, isn't Amen. it, with our church Amen. family. And uh, I'm really thankful Pastor Landon <clears throat> had started uh, the bracelet thing. Now, if my mother was to come to church with me, she's going to be 81 this year, I would tell her to wear a mask, and I tell her to wear a mask everywhere. And I'm saying that because I personally don't wear a mask unless uh, I go to stores and stuff out of respect. But also I tell my brother and a sister that uh, one has uh, leukemia and bad heart and the other one's going through surgery right now or tomorrow. And I tell them to wear a mask. So I respect those that some really need to wear a mask to protect themselves. And uh, I wear a mask when I, I go in the stores for respect. So I, I like this system you got, Pastor Landon. As we get ready to receive our offering tonight, as, uh, and we're going to receive an offering, they're not going to hand it from person to person for safety. They're going to hold it in front of you. But you can give from your seat into that, or you can give from your seat on your credit card by going online, or you can go right back here in the corner, uh, and uh, there's a kiosk back there that you can put your credit card in or you can put it in an envelope and drop it in if you want to do it that way and uh, all of it's up here how to do that but, uh, but I want to say it is a privilege in giving into the work of the Lord the Old Testament ends and it's actually the bridge out of the book of Malachi talking about how blessed how God blesses those that honor to give and Jesus in, in the Gospels right in the very in Matthew, talks about, he, he tells the people they ought to tithe when he's telling them they ought to love each other and have justice for each other and, and not just tithing, but you ought to tithe also. And then we see something very close to what Malachi talks about, Apostle Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And he loves to bless cheerful givers. So I want to encourage you in that tonight to be a cheerful giver, to, to tithe, and, to, and also talk so much about helping those in need and helping those that are in ministry. So I want to encourage you in all that tonight. As the offering comes by, have your stuff marked. If it's not marked, it goes to kingdom builders. That's to help build churches and build the kingdom around the world and in here in our own nation also. So let us pray over our offering tonight. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together. We thank you 
that we can honor your name by giving and help further the kingdom of God and showing our faith by giving. We bless your holy name. We are thankful and we praise you forever and ever. Bless each one here greatly as they give tonight. Prosper them, Lord, as they prosper the kingdom. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. all stand with me as we get back into uh, praising God through song and giving him our worship by singing. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we honor you. And God, you are worthy of our worship. And Lord, we know that when we are in a room with you, God, we know that we have your attention on us, that you are in this place with us. And you delight, your word says that you delight in the praises of your people. God, we want to delight you tonight. We want to bring a delight to you, a smile to you tonight. We want you, God, to look down, or not even look down, because you're right here. We want you to look at us, God, and that you would be proud of your people. Hallelujah. And how we worship you and how we give you our praise. Lord, we know that when you look at us, you see us, God, the same way that you see your son, Jesus Christ that we have his righteousness. And Lord, we thank you for that. Hallelujah. Where would we be, God, without your son? Lord, we're pretty pitiful people. We need a lot of help. And Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you don't give us what we deserve. We thank you, God, that instead of giving us what we deserve, which is nothing good, that you instead return return it Lord with grace you give us better than what we should be getting Lord you bless us oh God and Lord we want to sing of those blessings tonight we want to sing of your goodness tonight as a congregation Lord as individuals but also Lord as a as a whole congregation we want to lift up your praises in this room tonight and we know that when we do that chains do break we know that when we do that Lord mountains do fall Hallelujah. We, let's lift up the name of Jesus tonight, church. Amen. You are the word of the beginning. One with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now reveal. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater hallelujah and what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name name it is nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name oh, what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus hallelujah oh we praise you Lord 
give you the highest praise. We give you all our worship, Jesus. For you are worthy. You are worthy. Death could not hold you. Prevail to be before you. You silence the boast of sin and pray. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no thing for you to do and your hand is moving right now you are still showing up at the tomb of heaven Lazarus and your voice is calling me out right now I know you're able You never lost a battle And I know, I know You never win yeah. Yeah. Everything's possible By the power of the Holy Ghost A new wind is blowing right now breaking my heart of stone taking over like it's Jericho and my walls are all crashing down right now I know you're able my God will come through again you can Oh, 
battle and I You never lost a battle And I know, I know You never will Yes You never will, Lord Hallelujah Ooh You never lost a battle You never lost a battle You never lost a battle You never will Oh, that's right. You never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. Ooh, you never lost a battle. You never will. You never will. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. Hey, you never lost a battle. You never will. You never will. You never lost a battle. Oh, you never lost a battle. You never lost a battle And I know, I know You never, I know And I know, I know That you never win One more time I know, I know You never will Yes, hallelujah Praise you Lord Praise you Jesus Of you, of you can testify out loud with your voice and just shout amen or agree that God has won many battles for you in your life. And you can also testify that you know he's not done. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and clap your hands. Move the mountains. You told the wind and waves be still. Cast out demons. You bid the empty soul be filled. And now there's breakthrough. And now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power. And the keys to do the same. You hold redemption. Made accusers drop their stones, showed us mercy. With your mighty miracles, now there's breakthrough. Now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power and the keys to do the same. Now we proclaim, Jesus, Woo! once for time.
victory make this personal I walk in your victory and I stand in your authority and I stand in your authority and it's all for your glory amen oh, I walk yes I walk I walk in your victory and I stand in your authority and it's all for your glory amen amen hallelujah thank you lord hallelujah thank you jesus praise you lord let's wait here guys let's just wait here for a moment bring up words for a song called Refiner. The altar's where you meet us. Take me there. Take me there. What you need is an offering. It's right here. My life is here. I'll be a living. Hallelujah. Sacrifice for you, you'll refine the refiner. Don't want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire and purified. You take whatever you desire, and Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by the fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I 
want to sing that song again and we'll get back to it. But I was listening to a, a sermon the other day. I was just on YouTube and wanted to hear a word. So, and the preacher was given this message where he made the illustration. He's married and he said, one day early on in our marriage, my wife came to me and she asked me, is there anything that I do that bothers you? Which could open up a field day in marriages as we know, but um, they were all very gentle about it. But the wife sincerely wanted to know, if there's something that bothers you, I want to stop doing it. And so, you know, he shared a couple of things and then he asked her the same thing and apparently she shared a whole lot of things for him. But he said, I was so impressed with her because I noticed for the next several weeks and for the months that came after that, that she really did try and she really did make an effort to stop doing the things that she knew bothered me. And it was a really great way to illustrate what our love for God should look like, how that should manifest in our own lives. Do we ask God, does this bother you that I do this? What bothers you? Sometimes he tells you you don't have to ask. But sometimes we don't take enough time to self-reflect. I know I'm guilty of that myself. When you're an extreme extrovert, you don't like to look at yourself. <laughs> you don't focus on yourself. You fill it with other people. So I want to just sing this song. We played it during prayer tonight, and it was really hitting me hard. And I thought, I think we need to sing this at worship tonight. But just ask God, what is it, God, that, how would you like to refine me? Is there something that I do that bothers you, that upsets you, that offends you? And let's take this time right now to just be in his presence, to be communicating with God, be listening to God. Amen. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there. Take me there, what you need is an offering It's right here, my life is here And I'll be a living sacrifice for you You're a refiner, the refiner Don't want to be consumed I want to be tried by fire and purified you'll take whatever you desire Lord here's my life I want to be tried by fire and purified you'll take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life. Sing that again. Oh, I want to be tried by fire. Purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. And pure. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come here, let it fall. Yes, we want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place and set it ablaze, and I'll be a living. You're refined, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to be tried 
by fire and purify. You take whatever you desire, and Lord, here's my life. Hallelujah. Look at Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we bless you. God, we want to be a living sacrifice every day. Purify us, God. Refine us, Lord. Lord, we long for revival. But Lord, we know that we got, we need our own revival in our own lives and our own hearts to be stirred up first. Before we can see it as a big a part of our church or part of the community, God, it has to start within the individual, God. We got to be refined. We got to be ready to be reproved by you, to be checked by you. That when you convict, that we respond in humility. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we pray. Revive our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be seated tonight. I trust that you can feel the presence of God in this place tonight. For some of you, it's a foreign feeling. You don't know what to think of it. I'll say this. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, He wants to start one with you tonight. If you do already have a relationship with Jesus, He wants you to have a better one with Him. Open your Bibles tonight to the book of Acts, chapter 20. It is such a privilege. I count it a privilege and an honor to be able to share the Word of God. I absolutely love it. The time that I prepare it and pour over the Scriptures and I pray to this moment of culmination. has nothing to do with me when I share the word as I am tonight I don't want you to see me or hear me I want you to hear the Holy Spirit I want you to see God's words these are his words for you tonight and uh, let me just start with this God specializes in a lot of things. He's powerful and he moves powerfully in a lot of different situations and ways. One of those ways tonight that we're going to be discussing is that God specializes in turning disasters into opportunities. I'm going to be sharing the next two weeks after this one what God does with disasters. What God brings out of disasters, what God turns disasters into, how God uses disasters in your life. And as I prepared and studied, I have a new appreciation for how God allows disasters to happen in my life, in our world. And I believe you will have the same appreciation over the next couple of weeks. 
Job chapter 2, verse 10, and I'm not reading, I know, in Acts yet, but I just want to share this one verse. Shall we indeed, he says, after his disaster, after his family was taken from him, after all ten of his children died, after he lost every bit of his wealth in his business, his house, everything was gone. He says, shall we indeed accept good from God, but not accept adversity? Some translations call it trouble. Shall we accept good from God and not accept trouble? Some translations call it bad. Shall we accept good from God and not accept the bad? Some translations call it even evil. Although God is not evil, there is evil that is permitted to be in our lives by God. Shall we accept good from God and not the evil that's permitted to come into our lives as it did Job's life through Satan? 2020 in some ways has been a disaster and it's not over yet it may get worse still before it gets better what does this mean for you what does this mean for us for our family here tonight it means opportunity and we're going to be ready for it in a way I anticipate disaster because of the opportunity that it presents I'll share with you tonight a story about Paul everybody who's been living for Jesus any amount of time understands Paul knows who Paul is he wrote most of the books of the New Testament he was the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. That's what he was called. He was a man who saw great success in his ministry. Um, everywhere he went, revivals followed. All of this while, though, he also experienced one disaster after the next, probably disasters beyond anything that we will even ever experience in our life. He talks about them. But yet he still saw revivals everywhere he went. I want to look at one of those disasters tonight. It's in the book of Acts as you've turned there, chapter 20. I will have the words on the screen, but you've got it open in your Bibles in case you highlight and underline and take notes. Paul ends his final missionary journey, his third one, and at this point he feels led to do something crazy, to go to the place where people hate him the most. Jerusalem. Let's begin to read in the scripture tonight. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. If you're with me, say amen. And now Paul says, I am compelled by the Spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city that I go through, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me there. So he feels compelled to go, but he's still yet warned that prison and hardship are waiting for him there. Verse 24, however, he says, I don't consider my life worth anything to me. It's nothing to me. My only aim in this life is to finish the race and to complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given to me. How many people can say that tonight? This task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul knew disaster was coming. I think, I believe that sometimes we can sense disaster. Sometimes we can feel it. We know it's coming. Somebody told me the other day that they could tell it was going to rain because their left knee hurt. They had an old injury. Every time the humidity gets a certain way, their knee hurts. So they get a headache. I can tell because the leaves turn up. I believe that there is a sense out there that Sometimes people have when they know something disastrous is going to happen. 
It might be a warning from God. It might be a check in your spirit. I don't know. Maybe it's, sometimes it's innate. Maybe it's just something that we have. Something spiritual, something soulish, something that maybe is built into us. But I believe that sometimes you can sense disaster. Paul knew it was coming. The Spirit had spoken to him. It wasn't audible. It was in his, in his heart. It was in his mind. But God communicates with us that way. Sometimes you might be warned that bad things are coming. And it's important that in these times, we're ready. Not necessarily, necessarily ready physically. I think that might be the first thing that we go to. But more ready spiritually and mentally as Paul was. And what I mean by that is what Paul stated here in that 24th verse. Are you living for Jesus? Is your life really worth nothing to you? Only that God works through your life. If you can say that I'm living for Jesus and he's living through me, then you're ready. If you've got that type of mindset and attitude about life, then you're ready. Is your aim to finish what God has started in you? Have you even begun it? And are you poised to complete it? No matter what it might cost you. No matter where you might have to go. No matter what you might have to do. In that sense, are you ready? Are you ready for the task of specifically, as he stated, testifying to the good news of God's grace? Telling your story? Sharing the gospel, telling people how Jesus is the Savior of the world. Sometimes we can sense disaster. I'm going to tell you right now, there's disaster written in this book. There's impending doom that's coming upon this earth. And we need to be ready. Let's continue in verse 27. Actually, go to chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 27. Paul arrives in Jerusalem. He meets with some of the elders there, leaders of the church. They give him some instructions. They tell him where to go. He's going to go through and do some purification rites things with some other, some other Hebrew men, shaving their head and all the things. That was a ritualistic thing that the Jews did. He's still a Jew. So he does that, and it says in verse 27, when seven days were nearly over, that time of purification, there were some Jews from the province of Asia. And they saw Paul was at the temple. They stirred up the entire crowd there, and they seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and against our law and this place. And besides, he has also brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul, and they assumed Paul had brought him into the temple. He had not. The whole city was aroused, and people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and they immediately, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were, listen to this, trying to kill him, they were working at literally killing him. News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers, and they ran down to the crowd. And when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, out of fear of the law, it says, they stopped beating Paul at this point. The commander came up, arrested him, and they ordered him to be bound with two chains. And then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd shouted one thing, some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks where the troops are at. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great 
that he actually had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, Get rid of him. Get rid of him. Paul's disaster is beginning. Just one of his many disasters that he incurred. This is one of the disasters that Paul experienced. And if you'll notice, he hadn't done anything wrong. He went to church. What ensued after that was nearly a three-year period of imprisonment, the longest of Paul's lifetime. He'd been in prison multiple times for simply preaching the gospel. This was the longest imprisonment of Paul's life. He went from the barracks with the soldiers in chains to an interrogation room with the chief priest of the Sanhedrin. If you read on, you realize he was later carted off to another town called Caesarea or Caesarea to stand trial before the governor. His name was Felix. After that, it tells us, he wasted away in prison for two entire years just waiting for the next governor to be elected into position, Governor Festus, so that he could then be tried by Festus. If that wasn't enough, he was shipped off to Rome, where he then awaited trial by Caesar himself. His arrest there was two years of house arrest. He wasn't able to leave his home, temporary home he had in Rome. So he was in prison for like five years. Talk about disaster. Talk about disaster. He's, he's, he's taking out missionary journeys. He see people come to Christ everywhere he goes. He's seeing revivals. He's seeing the power of God work amazing ways in his ministry and, and, and in his life and his personal life. And, and here he comes back home to Jerusalem, really, for a Jew, and he's arrested and imprisoned and left there for years. People, I don't know about you, but this is, this is, this is a disaster. This is not something someone wishes for themselves or even expects for themselves. And I'll say this, it wasn't fair. Paul's disaster was not fair. He didn't deserve this. As I said, he hadn't done anything. He was innocent. Listen to me. The enemy will try to attack you through evil-hearted people. He will use people who specifically don't like you. Paul was not liked by everybody. There were people who did not like Paul. And they did not want him to live. It was a complete injustice, though. Arresting a righteous, law-abiding man and putting him in prison and on trial for years. He had to try to defend himself. Not only was it unfair, but it took away his freedom. Paul's disaster actually took away his freedom. He was in prison under house arrest for five years. Couldn't go to the store. Couldn't walk around the town. He couldn't visit his friends. Couldn't even go to church. Listen to me. The enemy attacked Paul, and he tried to take something away from him that would make him regret his decision to live for Jesus. The enemy will do the same thing to you. He'll attack you. He'll try to take things away from you. He'll try to make you regret the moment that you said, I do, with Jesus. It's the exact same thing that happened with Job that I referenced earlier on. The enemy thought that if I take everything away from him, he will curse God and die. And that's exactly what his wife wanted him to do. She actually came to him and encouraged him. Would you just curse God and die? Why would you even follow God to begin with? Why would you accept Jesus in all of these terms, which is to sacrifice your life and to live like you're living right now? Paul, you subjected yourself to this the day you said, I do with Jesus. What the devil did not understand, though, was that even though he could affect Paul's circumstances, sure, he could change situations around him, he would not change his future. He might change Paul's situations, but he would never change his mind. He could change what was happening all around him, but he most definitely would never change his position in Christ. Listen, and if you're taking notes, write this down. On this earth, we might be bound by the same situations that this world is. 
but we are never sitting in the same position. I'm going to say it again. In this world, you might be bound by the same circumstances as the world is, but you're never in the same position. Why? Because God's got my back. I am never alone. My God will ultimately work out all of this disaster for my good. You see, that's the privilege I have in Jesus Christ. What is a lifelong struggle for some people is simply just a trial for me. What breaks some people down only makes me stronger. What is a life sentence for some and condemnation for some is simply a brief test for me. God tries me with things. He, like the song says, He tries me by fire to purify me. It's only a test. It's only an inconvenience for a short time. And then I become stronger and God is glorified. I have a home that nobody else knows about. A place that my Savior is preparing for me that He's called me to. It's a house in heaven that's called safety. It's on a golden street that's named eternity. We might be in the same circumstance, but we most definitely are not in the same position. This is the hope that we have. This is the hope that needs to be told out there. I want you to look at the way Paul was prepared for this. We already know he was. We saw his attitude, his behavior. He's like, listen, God, it's not about my life. It's about yours. I'm going to finish what you called me to do, whatever it takes. We already know his attitude. I want you to look now at what he did. The way he responded to this disaster is the same way that we need to respond to disaster. Let's look now. In verse 40, the last verse of the 21st chapter. I'll pick up there. Rachel, you can come back to the piano. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps, he motioned to the crowd. When they all became silent, then he said to them, in Aramaic, Brothers and sisters, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they all became very quiet. Jesus, or excuse me, Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied, I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I actually persecuted the followers of the way. That's the Christian church he's referring to. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and then throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can actually testify to themselves. They knew about him. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus. I went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem in order that they could be punished. But it was about noon on that trip. I came near Damascus and suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed all around. He says, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute? I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions, they, they saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. And I asked, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, get up, go into Damascus. There you'll be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had actually blinded me. There was a man there named Ananias and he came to see me. He was the devout observer of the law. He was highly respected by all the Jews that were living there. He, he stood beside me and he said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see again. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, 
and to hear the words from his mouth. You're going to be his witness to all the people of what you have seen and what you have heard. Last verse. And the most important one. And now Ananias says, what are you waiting for? Get up. Get baptized. Wash away your sins. Call on his name. That's the name of Jesus. When Paul experienced disaster, it didn't cripple him. It didn't cause him to give up. It didn't cause him to get angry. He used it as a platform. Disaster became his platform. His disaster became his opportunity. He used his arrest to gain an audience with his countrymen. And not only that, but if you read over the next few chapters, you'll realize of his imprisonment that he shared the gospel, that he shared his testimony with hundreds of people he would have never gotten the opportunity to share the gospel with. There are disasters in your life that will happen, that will come, and they will be open doorways, opportunities, there will be platforms for you to share the gospel, the grace of Jesus Christ with people you never would have had the opportunity to do so. People, opportunities at our doorstep. It seems odd to thank God for trials, to thank God for hardship, to thank God for disasters. But when they mean a platform of opportunity, we begin to really realize why God allows the things that He allows. We talked this morning about how God is not slow, but He's patient. Because the longer He waits to return, the more people will get saved. The moment he returns, it's done. Right now is the opportunity people have to repent, turn from their sins, and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is our opportunity. Paul got to testify to judges, officials, rulers, high-ranking military officials, leaders of cities, leaders of states. He stood before governors, high priests. He stood before kings. He even stood before the emperor himself and testified to the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He would have never gotten that opportunity without this disaster in his life. My message to you tonight is very simply this. Be ready. If you're not ready, get ready. And use disaster as a platform. You might be here tonight because disaster has been in your life. Some calamity has, has brought you here. This is an opportunity for you. You're here. God called you here. God ordained that thing. Why? To bring you back to a relationship with Him. Stand with me all over the sanctuary this evening if you can. As I spoke when I started, God wants a relationship with you. If you've never had one, He wants to start one with you tonight. If you've already got one, He wants to strengthen it. He wants you to look at life differently. He wants you to see that the chaos around us he turns those things into good opportunities. We've got opportunities. If what some local pastors and prophets are saying is true, then our country is in for some more disasters to come. Let's be ready for that. Let's use it to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's turn our disasters into opportunities. Let's use disasters as our platforms. Let's share the love and the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ with the entire world. I'm going to open the altars tonight. I want everybody to spend some time with God. I don't want you rushing out. Spend some time with the Lord tonight. If you'd like special prayer for anything whatsoever, if you want to stand in for somebody and pray for somebody else, then the pastors will be here tonight. We'd love to pray with you. Lay hands on the sick. 
seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come and seek around the altars all night long if you want to, okay? But I'm going to open the altars. You can make an altar in your seat as well. You don't have to come up here. Go wherever you're comfortable. The Lord's going to hear you wherever you're at. But we're available to you. And I want you to get ready. Get ready for what God has for you. I'm going to pray right now as I open the altars. Father, we thank you tonight. God, that you can take a bad situation and you can make it glorious. You can make everything good for us. That's not just what you can do. That's what you're going to do. That's what your word says. That's what these examples teach us. God, that you are our hope. You are the hope for not only us, but for the whole entire world. And people got to know it. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be propagators of your gospel, to share the testimony and the grace of Jesus Christ. Bring us into a close relationship with you and a closer walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Find a place.